Hey guys, I'm super excited for this episode. Today we're talking to Ryan Thomas. Now, this guy is incredibly talented. He's one of the most creative people I've ever met, and he's very near and dear to my heart. I've known him for about five years now. I can't believe it's been that long. Um, and I've been his artist manager, helping him you know, build his music career for about six months now. So I thought he would be the first, uh, a great first person to get on for this interview series because Again, his creativity is unlike a lot of people I've ever seen. He is obscure, he's, quir he's quirky, um, and he pulls ideas out of nowhere. Um, so I think you're really going to enjoy this, this video. Um, if you prefer to listen instead of watch, there is a podcast version of it as well. Um, and Ryan's got a lot of important messages to share in this video today. So he's going to talk about his creative process, He'll get a little technical with the music term, so just bear with me there, um, because I promise the overall message and what he has to share for all the creators out there is very important and worth the listen. So with further ado, enjoy Ryan Thomas. All right, we're recording. So Ryan, um, you are at a really exciting point in your career because yeah, you made it through all of the schooling and everything, and you're kind of diving headfirst into music industry. Yeah. Um, so I just, we're, we're approaching it in two different ways. So we're approaching it, number one, you as a creator, and number two, you uh, trying to build a career in this creative industry. Um, so take me back to when it like first started. How did you know you, you were creative? Like, did you have an aha moment? What was that like? Um, I don't really know the creative part. I just knew that music would have been the thing that I wanted to do. Because yeah. when I was a kid, it was like, I don't know, apparently since like a young age where I grew up, it, the radio station was 94.1 JJO. It was like the hard rock station. And my dad would always play it. And I'm like, 94.1 JJO at like two years old. And like, and my parents were um, like classic rock fans. My dad was probably the bigger music person in the house that I gravitated towards. And then I found out he had CDs, so I would steal those from the shelf. And then I was like, oh, this is cool. And then I never thought I'd be making music with people until, I don't even know, since I, maybe since I started, like, when I was had the drive to, like, join bands, because bands were always like, whoa, that's so cool. I want to be a rock star. I think everyone does that at one point. But I was like, I really, really want to be a rock star. Like, I want to live that life minus some parts of it because you know how that goes but uh <laughs> right um like I don't know it was just like just finding music and then getting my first drum sets and just kind of experimenting with it and then really just building my chops up and then just kind of I don't really know it's kind of a tough question yeah um but like um yeah I think that's might have been but then when I got to college I found out I got I got way more creative because I started learning about like well, I, like we took music theory and I started understanding that. And then I downloaded some music composition software and I'm like, this is cool. I can start writing my own stuff. And then just kind of branched off from just playing to being creative outside of a drum set setting to like, oh, like, and then I started getting into so much different music, like jazz, experimental, funk music, instead of just like the typical rock and metal stuff I was growing up listening to um, and playing with groups like that. and kind of it's kind of just where it kind of I figured I think college was maybe the biggest moment for the creativity part but the music part was always just a young age so it's all one right if you're making music you're being creative right so it, it yeah it's all the same thing so how what True. was that like in high school were, were you like in a a musical group of friends or like were you that odd kid out saying hey I'm gonna be a musician and everyone's going on to get their you know medical degree and <laughs> yeah um I don't know I was always like well I realized music was my thing especially after doing like sports and taking classes because like where I went to school like sports were like it's like if you're not like good at it you're not really gonna do anything <laughs> so I was like the drumline geek so I quit football my sophomore year quit track just because I didn't like it and then music and the music stuff was always like let's go and I didn't really get into bands until about eighth grade, which is still middle school technically, but I was the more dedicated one. Um, like I would annoy, 
it's funny we started on um, my band hunger moon years later and like he got avery like uh he i don't know i was just like we need to do this and then uh, i don't know i was just too into it and then um it was weird because w- there was this group um it was like avery's group and a bunch of other people they were starting their own bands and this was really when i started like kind of like found that click of people and it was weird because i was into classic rock and like classic metal but these guys were into like cannibal corpse and like bands that I like was like who and so and so that's what they were playing and i like had no idea how to play this stuff like i understood it because i listened to some heavier stuff but like it wasn't like that level of ex- like brutality as we call it um so like they were like hey check out this band called Morbid Angel and can you play this song Rapture? I'm like, I've never heard of this. I don't know what to expect. And the first thing out of the gate when the drums like kicked in officially, I just heard like a machine gun and I'm like, what the heck is that? And it's like, oh, that's that dude's feet. I'm like, okay, this is super cool. So and you so realize that's... it's time to take it to the next level. So you have to, you have to figure out how to do that too then. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of, um, kind of, started jamming with those guys and it's funny i learned how to do a blast beat which is one of those drum beats where the snare drums like the whole time and i learned it from a vocalist because he wanted to start like a black metal project he's like can you do a blast beat i'm like i have no idea what that is i've heard them but i didn't know the term and it was just like he's like he's just like just do this and i'm like okay and then i started taking it to the next level and then in my sophomore year my friend and very good colleague justin um Sunland, you you remember Justin Sunland? I do, yeah. Yeah, so him and I started. Well, I joined his band my sophomore year. I was the filling guy, and then I took over. I feel bad about that to this day. Um, and he was in like a kind of like a grungy kind of band. Um, and then Justin was one of those people who got into death metal too. And then so we started playing music that was starting to pick up to the next level. So you will go from grunge with like ballads and stuff to like this band that's like and like like some stuff and it it's funny because like justin i don't think if i met him my i don't think my plane would be where it's at because i'll never forget the day justin's like we're gonna play in something other than four four i'm like that's a thing and he's like check this out this is five four so you count five beats stuff four. i'm like i hate you and so i don't know i and that band was called moo um he had pretty good success for being a death metal band. Like we did a launch pad, this competition called launch pad um, through the Les Paul foundation. And surprisingly for what we played compared to everyone else, we made it pretty far. Like we got second place one year. Um, I think second place the next year and then alternate going to stay. Cause we, I don't know, we, we lost a couple band members and we were just like, eh, what do we do? Um, but I don't think if I met Justin, my playing wouldn't, be where it's at because I remember him getting into like 12 tone theory and he wanted to write a song but this was like two or like two years before we get, went to college and like four years before they even taught in like college theory class and he's like check this out I'm like this sounds so messed up so you but already you are, had jump start on it then coming yeah I did college okay yeah I didn't understand half of it like I took music theory class but we didn't get very far in it I'm in high school so yeah so that's kind of where I tried to like jump the gun and try to like yeah get out there but so how was it um switching to jazz after all of that that had to have been oh god um different world for you oh 100 percent um I didn't start playing jazz until maybe my soft maybe late sophomore year of college um I remember the my percussion professors because drum sets kind of what I gravitated towards like I was never a good marimba player like I totally failed my first jury on marimba and like I panicked and it it was it was a terrible time but like drum set and like the like timpani and stuff like that were kind of more of a strong suit I stopped doing timpani um like whoops my uh like I don't remember like my junior senior year um but I still I love playing it, but like drum set was always where it was at for me. So they really, they knew that. And they were like, we want you to get into the top jazz band next year. And I'm like, I have no idea how to do any of this. And I didn't get in the top jazz band, which I am completely fine with. But um, 
it was just insane because you you're so used to playing your bass drum in rock and metal and then jazz it's not as prominent so i'm trying to do these patterns with my bass drum while keeping a ride like a ding 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 ding, ding, ding ride pattern and it's just a whole different way of thinking and it was like to the point where my bass drum foot like it's like that limb just doesn't exist like i couldn't move it it felt paralyzed like i understood the concepts and then when you, it's a whole different level of listening because you have to like there's more improvisation with it there's more there's just so much like in jazz that it's hard to like comprehend like i'm still trying to figure out like what like it there's this thing that my one of my professors um well her husband and another professor that i know he has this phrase called jazz anxiety and it's literally like you don't think you're playing the right thing but you actually are as long as you're just not goofing around because like there's so much you can do with comping in jazz which is like complementing the instruments with the snare drum and the bass drum it's just a whole different ballpark and then the hierarchy of what's supposed to be loud it's on the kit to, yeah it's it was hard it still is hard i don't consider myself at all great at jazz like i can pull it off but like i'm not like my one of my uh friends in I study private we lift sometimes Mike Underwood. He just blows my mind every time. I'm like, there's no way I can do this. And our friend Austin Gaffner can't. I don't understand how he does half the stuff he does. But it has <laughs> influence and probably helped the way you play everything else just because of the ear that you have to have and Yeah. All that. And I've always had this thing where um Justin says like my playing's kind of through composed, so it's not like a set way of playing it so like I kind of just kind of play everything different every time I don't want to be like a robot because that's not fun um for me at least like I like playing drums but like I don't I want to be a free spirit sometimes so if I'm like like you're gonna play this beat and this fill I'm like nope I'm doing it this way and whatever happens happens deal with it so that's good that's good so when you um when you're writing a song and you're you're doing one of your electronic albums. Kind of talk about that process for you. Oh boy, um, it's literally just picking a key, and then kind of like looking at the piano roll and kind of being like, okay, let's make a triad with this, and then let's like, I kind of look at shapes nowadays. Like like, it's weird. Like seconds have this certain like the spacing between them, and they're so close, and then like kind of like spacing them out. It's kind of like an orchestration class where you like you have your whole grand staff and you're trying to just write like a like a piano piece but it's like orchestration um for like a whole orchestra so like I try to keep it like like sometimes I'm looking at it and it's like okay so this chord is this one so I don't try to think about theory as much like I understand like I'm in a key but like I'm not thinking about like this is going from a major one to a minor second to a yeah to a half diminished chord it's kind of like I just kind of throw notes in there and I kind of like figure out how they sound and then I kind of just copy and paste and then kind of move them sometimes otherwise I just kind of look at like where they're going so like if you're looking so like some of the notes go upwards some of the notes go downwards um sometimes I just drag them over but they're just going to get repeated that's Um, interesting so it's actually more visual for you I would say so um at least for the melodic parts, um, like solos, it's kind of, I kind of do whatever I want. Like I kind of pick like random things and kind of experiment with it. And then like the drum parts, I kind of do it like based off patterns and just like, okay, so this drum beat's going to have the bass drums here and then we're going to get the basic idea and then copy paste it and then just switch it up or just rewrite it. That kind of saves me time. But really, for the more of the background stuff or the accompaniments, it's kind of more of a visual. And I've actually, on the first um, album EP I did, which was Expanding Space, I don't really, I don't know, I still think about releasing that one to Spotify and everything, just because, like, the mixing was so bad, because <laughs> I was just like, oh, this has bass. I got to boost it all the way up. So, like, like I play in my car speakers, and you can't hear, like, the melody. I'm like, oh, my God, dude, what'd you do? Um, but... <laughs> Um, that one, I actually kind of, uh, there was, there was one track, I don't remember which one it was, but I actually drew like MIDI shapes. Like I drew like a planet or like a smiley face and like, I think I put, yeah, dude, or something like that in there. And it kind of contributed to the sound of one of the tracks. So I don't That's know. Crazy. I like, 
Yeah, and like I never really thought it'd be a visual thing. It's kind of like, um, like I think I'm a visual learner. Like I like to watch people and learn how they do stuff that way. So I think that kind of plays into the role of how I compose. But like at the same time, I really just don't think about it. I just kind of do it, and whatever sounds good sounds good. So yeah, do you like um, think of certain situations? You got you have. I only ask because you have some crazy names for your songs and your album so I'm just wondering like do you think of that after like what's the what do you think about when you are going through that um the names they kind of just I just kind of make up something like I like so there's this band called Magma that I like if, uh they're like my favorite band ever they're a French band out of they came out in the 19, late 60s, I think. And they're actually a genre called Zool, which is basically jazz fusion, prog rock combined. Like, and they are like the most unique band you ever heard. So look up Magma, um, Christian Vander's Magma. Um, that's, and like, oh my God, so good. I, can't, I, can't, I get speechless <laughs> every time I talk about them. And so they have this really unique genre that's like this fusion of everything that gets categorized as its own thing. No one sounds like them, even bands that like even come like off of them. Like there's a band called With Dorje, which is um, a track off of one of their Magma's albums with members of that band. And they still don't sound like Magma. And so like Magma, they have their own made up language. So it's about like, so like the earth gets destroyed and they have to go to this planet and their refugees are, I think I'm getting the story wrong, but something along those lines. And, everything's in their own made up language. And I kind of like that because they use really unconventional things that I would never hear in my life. Um, so like when you hear it, it's like, they don't really have any songs in English. So that kind of plays a role in like, I kind of want my song titles to be kind of fancy. Um, so like, I don't want it to be like, like a really generic thing, like a uh, TV sitting on a TV stand. I want it to be like something really out of the box and really weird, like, ozone hopscotch it's like with that one i recorded it didn't really know what to think to call it but i was like i don't remember i was watching like some environmentalist video or something it was like how the ozone has holes in it i'm like what if you like played hopscotch in the holes like that could be cool or like snow in july but it's on mars i think i was looking up something about like a mars volcano where they discovered water on like the um north pole of mars so it's kind of I don't know, kind of draws from like magma and the weirdness of that group. Cause that ever since I found them, thanks to Justin, of course, um, it's kind of like the weirdness is like normal to me. And I've never been a, how you say a normal person. Like I've always been like this weird quirky black dude. <laughs> who's always been like a little bit different. And like, um, so I don't know. It's kind of like, just kind of, let the creativity flow because I think I want that to reflect in the yeah. song and plus it could be one of those things where it's like what does that even mean I'm gonna listen to this and it's more appealing like um I think for me it's more appealing for someone scrolling because like if you look at the track God's Fear or Ozone Hopscotch I think I'd gravitate more towards Ozone Hopscotch because it's kind of more out there because like when I think of God's fear, it's just kind of like this big ball of um, like clouds and like Jesus, <laughs> like <laughs> divine figures, but like ozone hopscotch. I just picture like, like an alien, like, like throwing a rock and then jumping through the ozone holes. So I don't really know. It's so that a, is the perfect definition of creative creativity. It's taking two completely unrelated things and making something brand new, which is literally how you're figuring out these titles and everything. Yeah, for sure. That's cool. That's cool. So yeah. how, like, how do you deal with creative blocks when you are writing music or improving or whatever? How do you deal? Uh, with that? It's a good question. Sometimes I just leave and I just don't think about it. I just kind of do something else. Like, um, like yesterday I was practicing it and I'm like, I can't, I don't know how to play drums right now. So I walked away from my drum set for, I think like an hour and a half. I came back. I'm like, okay, let's try this again. And I tried it again. And I was like, okay, you sound decent again. And so then I stepped away a little bit longer and then I came back and I was like, oh, okay. This sounds so much better now. 
because I found at a young age when I used to get like grounded for like my parents were like they were mean no my parents are amazing but um, <laughs> the worst thing they would do is take away my drums and I remember one time they took away my drums for like a month because I don't know what I did but they they were mad at me and I was like I don't get why you're doing this this is educational <laughs> But, like, they took away my drums, and, like, I thought that was the end for me. I'm like, I'm never going to get good at this, blah, 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 blah. And I, this is, like, I don't know. I was young enough, probably this is, like, fourth or fifth grade maybe, maybe sixth grade. And it was to the point where it was, like, I'm just starting out. I'm going to lose all my chops. I'm going to have to reteach myself because I've already had to teach myself once. And then I got my drums back. I set them up, and I played like I've never played before. Or it's like when I play shows with like um, Shield of Survivors or A Millennial. Um, I don't really practice the songs per se, but I can like, they're so engraved in my head where I can go out and play them and it would be like nothing happened. Or sometimes I even play them better than I would in a practice situation or a recording situation. So sometimes with the creative blocks, with as being a drummer, that helps. With pieces, it's kind of the same thing. Like I have a piece that, I wrote and it's kind of a, based off like Steve Reich, Philip Glass, minimalist kind of thing. It's kind of based off Octet by Steve Reich because um, it has like double of every instrument. It's, uh, I think it's a nine piece um, group, but uh, it kind of has like these repeating figures like Octet would. But like I got to a point where I, this was probably two years ago, I believe, and it's still sitting there unfinished. And then, um, I was in an ensemble called Sounds Like Now, and I was like, I could take parts of this piece and throw it into this really weird graphic notation piece. So it was like, I took it like, so you start out playing this one figure, which is basically the idea of how it starts out on the, um, the piece that I never finished. And then it has like these lines that go to different figures. And everyone kind of like figures out their own figures and kind of, it's kind of like a big old maze. So I took a lot of ideas from that piece and then I, um, and I still have never finished the original one, but it serves its purpose in the new one to give me ideas to compose a piece. And we, and that one got played at a Sounds Like Now concert, which was really cool. So it was, it was nice to have that, knowing that parts of that piece that I started um, would go into something else. So it's kind of like, reduce reuse and recycle so like I just recycled what I had and yeah so sometimes that helps otherwise I just kind of just start something new or just do something totally unrelated so. yeah okay so how how do you get into the creative zone then so you wake up you decide okay I'm gonna I'm gonna write a new piece of music oh boy you, um what do you do I don't do anything, I don't think. I think I just sit down and it just comes to me. Like, um, I think, like, there's this, the one that I showed you that's not released yet. My, I'm still waiting for my cousin to um, finish the artwork, which is amazing on that 12-minute um, 70s-inspired um, electronic piece that's, like, um, 12 minutes long, seven parts. Um, that one, I have no idea how that came to be. I just don't know. I just was listening to this album, and I was like, well, I think it's actually been a while since I listened to the album. And I was like, I'm just going to try this. And I tried it and I like it. It's not like a hundred percent where I want it to be like sound wise, but it fits what it needs to do. Yeah. Um, some days it's like, I wake up and I just, am like, I'm not going to be creative today. And then boom, I'm just like all out of nowhere. I'm just like set up pro tools, blank page, make an instrument track to start something I'm like okay let's start this like um my other project Sun Wrecker this is what around the time I started the electronic stuff so this is when I was doing like concrete trees I think um I started my Sun Wrecker project because I was like because it's based off black metal music and I really like that side because like I was working on like the electronic stuff that's more like happy happy joy joy stuff and then I'm like I love evil demented stuff <laughs> or like <laughs> weird, like, like weird, like space themes or like celestial themes. And then I was like, I can make this like, I think there's like an Instagram post, like buried at the bottom of my musician page where it's like, 
this is the happy and the sad side of me or like the angry side or something. And it's like, like concrete trees, which is like, boom, like all like you can listen to it without, without like freaking out. <laughs> but then Sun Record was like this thing where it's like, can, the idea was, can I make black metal music that's digital? Because black metal music is probably, it's a really interesting genre. Like the production quality of a lot of it is absolutely terrible. And that plays into the aesthetic of it because it's a really dark genre. And it's, and a lot of people think black metal, it's like the satanic stuff, but a lot of the bands, they are not even like satanic. They talk about like celestial themes or like, like running through a forest, kind of like story based. Um, and then you get into like symphonic black metal, which is like, like, like a black metal band with just like this massive orchestra behind them. Um, and then, I never really heard of electronic black metal and I think it's actually frowned upon. So if I get murdered because of this, I'm not going to be surprised. <laughs> um, so I was like, can I make this music um, digitally? And I've tried it before and it worked out okay. But then I started doing Sun Wrecker and then it was like, how can I do this? So I found like these MIDI guitars that sounded terrible. And then I put like this amp simulator on it. So like Castles of Oblivion, the, um, the most recent one I did was like, there's like this really high static <laughs> throughout the whole thing. And it kind of plays into like the theme of it because um, I don't want it to be like amazing quality. I want it to be like gritty, kind of hard to listen to. And if you can make it through it, I love you for it. <laughs> um, and it's like, like I don't really use vocals in the electronic stuff. Like I'll use like, maybe like um like stuff i find off free websites but like sun Wrecker, i'm blowing my voice out in like this raspy crazy way talking about like castles like getting sucked into black holes and stuff so like that was probably the one of the, i would say it's one of the more creative ideas i've had because i still can't find really anyone that can do a project that has a project like that mm -hmm. i mean it's easy to do but it's like i never thought it would be what it is and i are working on a new lp right now and i recruited um one of my band members mike shop who's an a millennial xeno blood and now sun record with me and he he kind of said that it turned from what my original idea was to something completely different because it's less conventional so it's kind of like alternative black metal synth electron i don't know how to describe it you'll just have to this this next one's gonna be really cool. It's gonna be really unique. So, awesome. uh, so yeah. because you're creating some very like niche, different genres, have you had any criticism or any rejection from it? And if so, like how how did you handle it? Um, honestly, I don't think I've had any really like huge criticism for it. I think the biggest thing with Sunwrecker I've gotten so far is when I had this generic black metal font and people were starting to notice that and they were like, I hope they get a new logo or like, I haven't heard anything like this completely sucks yet. Like I've, I've actually, there's this app called Amino and I looked up Sunwrecker. I'm like, hey, curiosity. And some guy posted, he's like, I really dig this. And I was like, first person, I'm like, dude, I like made this and like, um, we have an LP coming out. It might take a while, but that's okay. <laughs> and like, I'm like, okay, so this might have something going for it. Um, so not really any negative thing. The worst thing I sometimes see is like the neg like the thumbs down sign on YouTube. And it's like, I get that people aren't always going to like what people create. Like I like um, Magma and it's funny because it's funny. I showed one of my ex-girlfriends she was a metalhead too, and and like she likes some like out of the box music, and then I showed her Magma, and she was like, "No, never again." I'm like, "Dang it!" And then like my girlfriend now, like she likes more like folky, poppy stuff, hip hoppy stuff, which is cool because I like that stuff too. And I showed her Magma, and she's like, "Wow, I like this," and like she gets where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. So like. I kind of understand that there's not all music is going to be for everyone. Like there's like, like I don't really like country music. Like I can handle it, but like modern country, like pop country, I can't really do like, I respect it. It's not something I listen to all the time. Sure. But like, yeah. And I mean, like 
I mean, everyone's going to like or dislike something. So I kind of just accept that. So if someone hates my music, that's cool. You hate it. It gives me ideas for making my products better. And if I continue, and I've kind of learned this from a young age, if you keep doing something that you want other people to, that they want you to be, and you can't be yourself, there's really no point in trying to be original. So I try to be original all the time because like um, being like, so not to get into like any like racism thing, like stereotype thing, but like yeah. being African American who likes rock music is not as common as an African American that likes hip hop. Sure. And that was something huge for me growing up because like everyone's like, yeah, you're, you should like this. And I'm like, I don't like this. And like people were like, some like people were like dude listen to this it has a like, guitar solo and i'm like it's not a rock song so i don't like it and it's just i mean like as time goes on and i've grown to appreciate music on all levels all scales um i've liked hip-hop more like i have like playlists of everything and like people are like you listen to rap yeah i'm like i have a playlist that's 10 hours long of hip-hop i've listened to every single song <laughs> and so it's kind of one of those things where it's like, I don't care what people think. And I've learned that from a young age, thankfully. Um, and I prove it and it just adds to my fuel to get to where I need to be. And I don't care what people think. And it's, it's funny because some people are like, dude, that's so cool what you're doing. And I'm like, Hey, remember when you bullied me for liking this music? And it's kind of funny to see the reaction. I'm just like, Hey man, it's got to stick to who you got to be. And I think I love that's that. one. Yeah, for sure. And I think a lot of people just need to realize, like, not everyone's going to like, it's like, it's like shoes or like clothing. Like, it's like the Nikes versus Adidas thing. It's like, oh, I love Nike. I hate Adidas. Okay, whatever. They're basically the same thing, just a different brand. You know? So yeah. that's kind of my... And I think my... that comes across in your music, too. And I think that helps you get those obscure ideas that you have. Um because you, you don't you don't give a shit what people think. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. And like when I was in college, we have this group called Sounds Like Now. I don't but it sounds like now there when you were Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's one of those really obscure ensembles. Like there's people that show up and they just don't get it. And like I it, sometimes it is what what I found as a player that sometimes the player experience can be sometimes a little bit more valuable than the audience experience. But like it's so cool because like it gives you so many different ideas like people that are like playing like I had to play a piece that was for all squeaky toys an art piece that was just pieces of paper like amplified in a microphone and it's like this stuff totally opened up my mind so I'm kind of like I don't care what people think I'm gonna make music I'm gonna play music I like and honestly like if I could listen to something forever I might listen to something more obscure rather than melodic and fun and then like i'd rather listen to something atonal and just weird so yeah that's kind of my stance on all that stuff awesome i love it well that's a good place to kind of um wrap up so i i just want you to kind of let everyone know like what current project are you working on right now what can they expect from you in the future yeah so um i i say the most recent project i have a couple so i'll just give a few yep. um so i have xenoblood which is my newest metal band it's kind of uh, one of our guitar players really likes aliens and so we have like a lot of these sci-fi themes um I, was say, I just see like an outer space theme all over the place with you <laughs> yes that is true i did i am an astronomy geek because it's just so awesome and fascinating and just space is just an amazing thing and it's just so vast like it's like musical possibilities. It's infinite. Yeah. So it kind of, I guess I can relate it to that. But like Xeno Blood is super cool because we, it was kind of an offshoot of a millennial because all the members, well, three of the members, me, the vocalist and one of the guitar players are in a millennial or were in a millennial. So um, that's really cool. And we do have like a second vocalist we're working with. Um, so it's kind of like two vocalists, guitar, bass and drums and then whatever weird wonky alien things. So that one's going to be super cool. And then I have a 12 minute um, project that um, is kind of like a 
story, like a instrumental story um, that I should have released soon. My cousin who is in high school, who is a fantastic artist, um, her name's Nadia and she's getting scoped out by like all these art schools in like Chicago. And I'm like, dude, you gotta like draw me something for this. And so she sent me like a draft of it and I'm just like, holy cow, this is amazing. So that's coming out. And then I have a electronic collab with one of my friends too. Um, he was a, he was actually in jazz band with me in college and he, um, fantastic drummer's name, um, Evan Barrels. I can never say his last name, Barrels Sterry. Um, you can look him up at EC Barrels Sterry, um, on Facebook. Um, he is amazing drummer, like blows me out of the water every time. Um, and he's such a nice person. And, um, I was like trying to do another electronic album and I just couldn't think. And I'm like, dude, you want to collab? So we're doing a big electronic collaboration, remote sending stuff back and forth. And that is going to be super cool. Um, other than that, I have one more electronic album that's mastered right now. It's like two, well, three, three, two, three minute tracks. And then one short little one minute weird intro thing. So that should be coming out in the future. I have to discuss that with you. Um, and then, um, yeah, that's really the more recent stuff I've been working on. And then just stuff with all the other bands, hopefully doing more session work soon. So, yeah. Cool. Um, so if you had one message you would share to anyone else trying to make a career out of either music or art or whatever, something creative, what would that, what would that advice or message be for them? Regardless of what people say, how much this costs you, how much um, uh, like adversity you go through with this. Cause it's not always the most like, like people are like, Oh, Hey, you should be a doctor. Oh, you should do this. Don't let your dreams be a dream. Go for it. Do whatever you have to, to get there. Um, create, even if you, even if you work a day job, if you just try to get where you need to be and get to a place where you can feel fulfilled because I find every day that I'm able to create is amazing. Like granted, I don't like going to a full-time job. I'd rather be just doing music all the time, but sometimes it has its perks like during COVID. Like if I was a full-time musician, my income would be cut substantially in half. So um, I say just keep doing it and don't care what people say because you're going to find your own path. You're going to find what you like. And that's the biggest thing is liking what you like. Don't, don't care what other people think. Just go for it and just follow what you think is right. Because you probably are right. And who knows? And that makes you unique. And I think the world needs more uniques. Love it. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Cool, Ryan. Where can they find you after this if they want to look you up? Okay, so you can find me under my bands, A Millennial, Xenoblood, um, Shield of Survivors. Um, I think those are the current ones. So you can find those on Facebook. Shield of Survivors and A Millennial currently have um, Instagrams too. Um, we're all on YouTube as well. Xenoblood's more um, Facebook right now and YouTube. Um, we'll probably start building that up. And you can find all those on Bandcamp. Um, you can find me on all streaming platforms. You can find most of my bands, Shield the Survivors and Amelie, are currently on all streaming platforms as well. Um, if you want to look up my electronic stuff, it'd be under Ryan Thomas. Um, so you, I would look up Ryan Thomas Godspear because I've been having problems with like Amazon or I think it's Amazon and a few other platforms putting my music with another Ryan Thomas. So like, I keep thinking I should just make an artist name for myself, but nah, I don't want to. Um, <laughs> well, so, we'll, link them, we'll link them in the show description too. So people can click well, on the links too. Yeah. So really anywhere you can find music, SoundCloud, I'm on SoundCloud too. Um, I'm probably more places too. I just don't know what they are. <laughs> awesome. So, yeah. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much. This was awesome. And uh, yeah. we'll talk soon. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Awesome. Okay. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Bye, Ryan.